now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, in this uh, Indus uh, River System webinar series. Uh, we are excited to have uh, Professor Shahid Azam Saab, uh, who is joining us from um, University of Regina, Canada. Um, Professor Shahid Azam had been working uh, for more than 30 years in the fields of geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering. Though his research, through his research, he has devised advanced testing techniques and methods and modeling protocols to manage civil infrastructure and develop natural resources. He has trained dozens of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and has authored more than 140 publications in journals and conferences. So uh, Professor Saab will be talking uh, about water management in agriculture and mining. And since he's in time zone, he's already midnight, so I'm not taking more of his time. And I'm inviting you, sir, to please kick off your talk. Over to you, Professor Shahid Azam Saab. Thank you very much. Uh, is the uh, presentation on your screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yes, sir. OK, thank uh, you very uh, much. It's visible, but uh, sir, you'd like to have yeah, a slide. That's uh, it. From that's it. Yeah. I did the slide show already. Yeah, it's perfect. OK, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Shahid Azam and I'm in the, at the University of Regina here. And in a bit, I'm going to tell you where Regina is. Um, uh, I will be focusing today in this presentation on water management in uh, agriculture and in the mining industry. And basically what I will be doing is sharing the research work of my students, uh, past students and some uh, current students, as well as postdoctoral fellows. Uh, that's been either, the work has either been completed recently or is currently ongoing. Uh, we know uh, that life on Earth depends on the availability of clean water and its safe use, uh, uh, safe disposal uh, uh, after we actually use it and then maybe even recycling. So all of that whole maybe water cycle uh, is important for, for, uh, for us. Uh, water may be at surface in the form of lake or oceans and then it uh, interacts with the atmosphere in, in terms of uh, the wind and the uh, sun and the temperature and the and so on. And so those land atmosphere interactions become very important in nature uh, as well as in the industrial settings. And I will be discussing primarily the mining setting and uh, also the uh, agriculture context. So those uh, anthropogenic slash industrial activity also govern the presence of water in both space and also with respect to time. And this means, therefore, that sustainable design of uh, facilities such as a canal system for irrigation or maybe a cradle to gra grave mining operation, it requires a clear understanding from us in terms of the water budget, where is the water, each drop of water, where is it in the air or in the soil or in the um, in the canal or in the river? And also the quality of water, is it clean uh, to use uh, for agricultural purposes or for drinking purposes and so on? So my main focus today is to present a few case studies on water management in these two industries. Let's take the example of the Canadian prairies and primarily looking at the southern part of the prairies. Uh, on the right of your screen is the map of uh, Saskatchewan. It is almost or close to the size of Pakistan. It's in the middle of the Canadian prairies. On the left of the province is Alberta, which is also same size. And on the right of your screen will be Manitoba. So the sum total of these three provinces 
it's a huge area, almost three times that of Pakistan. And this whole area is arid to semi-arid, very low precipitation. And most of the precipitation or, or part of the precipitation is in the form of snow. Uh, but we get most of our water here, uh, not directly through precipitation, but in the form of uh, basically water coming from glacial meltdown uh, or snow melt from Alberta to the left of us. And it is basically conveyed through the South Saskatchewan River. The entire region is very flat. And this means that there are no real uh, ditches to create lakes and ponds uh, with a lot of depth, basically. So it's not very deep, uh, even if there is a lake or a reservoir for. Uh, and so the surface areas of the existing lakes is there are some very huge and uh, therefore we lose a lot of water to evaporation. And evaporation is affected by so many factors. It's a complex phenomena. Uh, and my doctoral student, uh, Jared Silken, recently summarized various factors affecting evaporation. And he classified all, all of those to four major classes of momentum. And that those are on the right, uh, top right of your screen, mass, uh, energy, and morphology. And then uh, on the left hand side of your screen, you're seeing in the atmosphere, the main parameters are the solar ones, solar parameters which deal with radiant energy, heat energy, uh, primarily originating from the sun. And the vapor parameters are connected through the ideal gas. And we assume that uh, uh, water vapor is an ideal gas. And then the air parameters include velocity and sensible heat, energy and total pressure and all that kind of stuff. In At the surface, uh, there are so many parameters. The, uh, all four parameters of momentum, mass and energy and morphology, they're taken into consideration. And below the surface, there is the properties of the liquid and the solid phase, liquid being water and solid being solid particles because there may be water entrapped within the pore system of soils uh, and they affect the heat of conduction. Jared basically took it upon himself uh, to capture all of these parameters in his experimental program. And what he did was very interesting he basically developed what we call a bench scale atmosphere simulator or BAS, right? In essence, his new equipment can monitor uh, various parameters using high quality precision sensors within this uh, setup. It can be put on a bench or, or, or on the table basically within the lab. Uh, and he can control the different conditions within this within this equipment. The sample of water or soil containing water is placed in the chamber uh, and its mass is measured with respect to time using a very sensitive scale balance. Similarly, the conditions within the uh, primarily within southern Saskatchewan. Jared developed a parametric data set shown some uh, in the table below here, representing various weather scenarios of uh, spring, summer and fall, both daytime and nighttime. Um, and these are the uh, because he was assuming that under the winter conditions, there is no evaporation and probably rightly so. Um, and then he's basically saying air temperature, air uh, humidity, velocity, solar radiance, and surface temperature, all of those. And based on those, he's developing a set of criteria that he can then apply in his equipment and determine evaporation under those scenarios. The data given here basically shows 16 different scenarios. 
day and night. Uh, sorry, six uh, different scenarios here uh, of 16 years of uh, measurement. And these numbers are coming basically as average values of uh, hourly measurement over a long period of time in different uh, towns, basically making covering an area kind of a square area between Regina, uh, Swift Current, Kindersley and Vineyard. Um, and these also, this area includes what we know as the Gardner Dam and the Lake Diefenbaker behind the dam. Uh, and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the Lake Diefenbaker. It's a huge reservoir of, uh, of water. And the dam itself was constructed about the same time as Turbella was constructed by uh, the same consultants, uh, uh, the British consultants who worked on both dams at the same time. Uh, he compared his measured evaporative flux uh, that he did determine in the uh, bass or the equipment uh, and then compared that with different equations, the mass transfer equations at the top and a combination of mass transfer uh, and uh, energy methods together. Uh, his results on distilled water, and here I'm showing distilled water here. Uh, it, it indicated that most of these equations fell within kind of one standard deviation of uh, experimentally determined values. He then used uh, his uh, numbers to determine cumulative annual evaporation from the lake. And he find, found that approximately 1800 millimeters of evaporation is taking place uh, uh, from the lake per year, of which 80% occurs during daytime, and rightly so. This is the first time we have actually been able to at least estimate uh, the evaporation from such a big lake. And it's very important for locally here because South of this uh, or, or downstream of the dam, the Gardner Dam, uh, there is a new uh, construction of a canal system for irrigation purposes. It is a $10 billion uh, proposed construction and partly already uh, in the design and, and uh, construction phase in the initial pilot scale. So our study becomes quite important locally here. If, if I increase through the canal system the surface area of the water by another uh, percent, how much more evaporation will occur from the surfaces in the canal? And that's a very important question to answer here. So our study are very is very relevant here. His investigation also uh, found that the rate of evaporation from saturated brine. Now I'm putting sodium chloride in the water. Previously it was distilled water, now it's sodium chloride saturated. And he basically said that evaporation from a saturated brine is half of that from distilled water. This is a very interesting development because locally we also have a lot of potash mining, which is KCL or um, used for uh, for um, uh, making uh, fertilizer here, and uh, and if in their uh, tailings containment facilities, which I'm going to describe in a little bit detail uh, uh, shortly, uh, it's it's very good news for them because they can actually bring the water back from the irrigate from the containment facility back for ore processing. Um, overall, you can see that there are so many similarities between Saskatchewan and and uh, and the Indus Basin because both are arid to semi-arid areas. Both have large dams and canal system. And then there is the issue of soil salinity. And I know all of these uh, either construction of large dams or uh, issues dealt with uh, in uh, reclamation projects such as Mardan Scarp or Sawabi Scarp already completed in the uh, 80s and 90s in the Indus Basin. Uh, 
So there are similarities and we are learning from what's being done elsewhere on the globe. Uh, here is now an example, if you will, of uh, evaporation from soil surfaces. Uh, evaporation rate in this case is not only a function of all the different parameters I showed earlier, but it also depends on intrinsic soil properties and the morphology of the soil at that time. And here I'm showing basically three different plots, all plotted with respect to gravimetric water content. The first one is evaporative flux. The second one is total suction. And the third one is a volume reduction or volume change. So when the, so when the water evaporates from a soil, the soil shrinks. That's what I'm trying to show. And then the difference between the pore pressure within the soil and the pressure in the atmosphere is what I call suction. And that's my middle block. When a soil is initially saturated, the actual rate of evaporation uh, is equal to the potential rate of evaporation, uh, similar to a water surface. And that part is my blue zone towards the right of your screen in all of these plots. Um, this zone describes the uh, this uh, green zone, the actual uh, evaporation uh, sorry, as the soil then dries out, I'm now going to the middle zone or the green zone. Uh, suction increases here and shrinkage does occur as the water evaporates from this soil. In this green zone, the middle zone, the actual rate of evaporation will remain constant and water flow primarily occurs through capillary action. This zone is describing the range of water loss within which plants can still survive, okay? And this is the optimal growth condition. In the red zone, obviously, the wilting point will occur and plants won't survive, they'll just, they'll just die. But this is also related to the morphology of the soil during the evaporation process. And Jared also developed uh, a controlled photogrammetry system, or CPS, he mounts his uh, sample on a turntable uh, in the middle of this, uh, uh, again, tabletop kind of uh, uh, equipment and rotates it over 360 degrees while he takes photos with his uh, new camera, uh, the CCD camera. He adjusts his camera at several elevations as shown in the bottom photo uh, schematic here. And repeats his process and all of the images, then he combines them and uh, and then uh, analyze them and convert them into three dimensional models uh, with millimeter scale precision. And uh, these are then used to track the uh, shrinkage of the soil. Here you're show I'm showing basically the soil. Uh, the top row is sandy soil and the bottom one is a clay soil. And you can see the corresponding images using his photogrammetry system. Uh, he's using this along with his bass to simulate evaporation for agricultural soils uh, such as sand and clay, and uh, he's using water and brine because we know with fertilizers there are issues uh, that are, are related to the evaporation. Uh, the effect of uh, fertilizer basically on uh, on the soil when the water part evaporates. This works well uh, uh, and it, it he has developed some very interesting uh, data so far and most of his work already got published, but it is useful for the irrigation system and for the control of water salinity uh, that we kind of alluded to earlier. I want to now uh, move on to water content prediction at a larger scale. Here I'm showing maybe a combination of four watersheds and the total area, which are all connected, and the total area here is something like 45,000 square kilometer. And the work here that's, uh, that I'm showing is done in conjunction with the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative 
Uh, the uh, postdoctoral fellow is Mohammed Zair, and he's jointly supervised by Dr. David Sachin and myself. Uh, Mohammed is focusing on this uh, overall area. It comprises of four uh, sub watersheds, as I mentioned. These include the uh, upper Capel, uh, the lower Capel watershed, right, and the Moose Jaw and Muscana Creek. He's using uh, SWAT or a soil uh, and water assessment tool to predict the amount of moisture in the top, let's say maybe about one foot deep uh, layer of the soil. And uh, uh, basically to do that, he's calibrated his model so far using stream flow data that I can show here and uh, his data uh, of stream flow kind of correlates quite well with the precipitation data. And he's using uh, information from NASA Earth observations and also field measurement within the uh, within the watershed at uh, at least one location. Results uh, of stream flow calibration indicate that his model is working and reasonably correlating with water budget in the watershed. The soil water content and here I'm showing uh, four different uh, uh, streams of data, yellow being uh, potential evapotranspiration uh, minus precipitation, and then blue is the field measured data, and then we have the SMAP measured data coming from uh, NASA, and then his own prediction using the SWAT simulation. And what we are showing here is the uh, spatial variability uh, in water content from year to year. And I'm showing primarily the summer months, uh, which is uh, when agriculture is happening here. Um, the model basically is telling us that uh, the western part of the, uh, of the region is becoming drier in comparison to the eastern part from year to year to year. And he's comparing uh, from 2015 all the way to 2020. Uh, this work not yet published, uh, but he's working on it. And what he's doing here is uh, using different climate uh, models, regional climate models, 11 of them. And based on the mean values of all models, his preliminary results indicate uh, that uh, soil water content will decrease uh, in the next 60 years, let's say 2080, by about 3% average value. This means that the soil will be drier in the coming decades, the local soil in this watershed. It then basically makes a lot of sense to have a, a canal system in southern Saskatchewan to make sure that uh, agriculture is still going on within the region and we are still developing and producing uh, crops that are required by uh, globally, actually. I want to now move and shift to the other industry, which is uh, the mining industry, and try to make some kind of connection uh, in terms of how can I save water within this industrial setting. Um, in particular, I will be drawing your attention to slurry tailings. These are slurries with uh, particulate ma matter and a lot of water uh, kind of within the soil or within this, uh, within this uh, suspension. Uh, and these are the waste residues from ore processing. So we'll use maybe water or maybe sulfuric acid or any other chemical process to actually extract the ore, uh, sorry, extract the commodity uh, such as um, uh, gold or copper or silver, etc. And then the result of uh, the uh, waste residues will be, will need to be contained in large containment facilities. If it's a sandy type material, it's very easy for the water to be uh, uh, to actually drain through sand and then the sand particles can settle under gravity. But if it's a muddy type material and a clay material, uh, it is very difficult to extract the water out from that kind of material. Um, 
and nonetheless, uh, in general, these tailings are disposed of uh, when they are uh, at that time, they're kind of have a toothpaste like consistency. So very, very, very soft. You cannot walk on it. You you will get drunk if you if you ever try to do that. And this means that they have a lot of absorbed water that can be removed and should be removed to increase the storage capacity of the containment facility, maybe to recycle water back for or processing and so on, or maybe to use less water to start with. Uh, the settling of a slurry um, generally uh, is a time dependent phenomena uh, in which solids settle uh, at the lower level in the containment facility and the water moves up um, through the uh, through the uh, through the pore system and and to the surface this process of dewatering depends again as i mentioned on the properties of the material clay versus sand conceptually it is possible to improve tailings properties by adding different coagulants ranging from polymers to gypsum to alum and so on and then perhaps uh, do that in large vessels which we call thickeners or increase uh, the acceleration uh, more than that of gravity by several hundred times uh, in large centrifuges. The dewatered material can then be deposited and allowed to desiccate uh, in open air and if your atmospheric conditions are on your side you may be able to get some more uh, water out through evaporation. I want to maybe uh, show you uh, a little bit more information on what we call oil sand tailings. Here in Alberta, uh, oil is not like light sweet crude. It is kind of embedded in the geological uh, strata. And uh, basically, uh, you have to uh, shovel it and, and, and wash it with, with water, basically, to uh, the, the oil will go to the surface and the sludge will go down. To produce one barrel of uh, oil, I just want to put it in perspective, we need two barrels of fresh water to do that. The presence of clays also in the, uh, in the oil sand uh, uh, strata uh, and, and therefore in the tailings inhibit the release of water. And, and, and this results in large volumes of loose sludge uh, that need to be that has been deposited over the last so many decades on ground. Till to date, we have more than one billion tons, which is one with nine zeros after it. Uh, it's been generated and it covers an area of almost 40 square kilometers on the ground. That's a huge area of loose sludge. We got involved in this. Um, oil sand uh, tailings uh, management problem uh, and developed a deposition method uh, working with our students, John Ovulagba, who is now the general manager, I think, of the entire country, <laughs> trying to lay out uh, uh, pipes. And uh, Ome Salma Rima, uh, who is doing a PhD now in the oil sand. And they conducted the bar testing and numerical modeling. This work that I'm showing here is uh, done by Rima. Uh, she used a centrifuge by putting the tailings in graduated tubes and then generating high values of uh, acceleration uh, 600 times more than that of gravity and measuring the amount of released water. And if you measure that with respect to time, you can then determine the rate of water release also. Her results showed that centrifugation of up to 600 times that of gravity, along with an anionic polymer, which is a synthetic material that she used in addition to centrifuging it, it generated a material with about 34% of the water removed. Uh, John then took her sample and uh, he conducted uh, numerical modeling using the uh, 
North, uh, Northern Alberta's climate condition and primarily he was modeling if he deposited deposits this material in very thin lifts, let's say about uh, half, uh, half a foot lift, right? Is that going to be enough to make sure that enough evaporation has taken place so he can put his next lift and then his next lift and so on? He applied climatic conditions of uh, northern Alberta and he determined the depth of tailings where atmospheric evaporation or drying is effective. His work also showed an additional uh, dewatering of the tailings by another 25%. So overall, a combination of centrifuge followed by thin lift drying really works uh, for at least in the uh, in the oil sand business. It's a lot of uh, loose sludge that need to be taken care of, but in the process, because so much water is used, as I mentioned, two barrels of water per barrel of oil, that water, if we can basically bring it back to the system, can then be reused, recycled, reused uh, to process more um, oil sand uh, material, basically. I want to maybe talk one more example um, uh, here, and this is related to uranium tailings. Uh, here in Saskatchewan, we produce a lot of uranium, about 18% of the total uh, global demand is produced here in Saskatchewan. And I want to maybe talk about the Key Lake uh, mine, which is about 800 kilometers exactly to the north of where I am, uh, of Regina. And this produces 13% of the global demand. So 18 in total and 13 just from this mine site. Um, it has an annual production rate of 19 million pounds. Uh, and the problem with this is it, it generates toxic tailings that uh, then need to be contained and isolated from the surroundings uh, and safely stored, basically. And here I'm showing the actual tailings containment facility. The tailings are really at the bottom, and I'm showing here, uh, the you're seeing the blue pond on top of the tailings, that is basically the blue area here in my conceptual plot, which is kind of a water cover on top of the, of the uranium rich uh, tailings. Um, and that is a requirement of the uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Agency. So the Dialman tailings management facility, the photograph and the schematic that I'm showing here, it was constructed in, in, in a previously uh, mined out pit, and it's about 1.3 kilometers long and 600 meters wide, and it, uh, a depth of about 170 meters. Water is uh, removed from the bottom here through different uh, methods, uh, basically side drains, and then that water is pumped and treated uh, on the site. At site, they basically uh, about 100,000 uh, liters of water is going through reverse osmosis on a daily basis before it is released to the environment. The DMF, the Dialman facility here, was uh, approved to contain uh, tailings at an up to an elevation of 400 and um, 66 uh, meters above sea level, which is the blue uh, line here on the pond. And it was uh, proposed to actually go up to 505 um, meters above sea level. So the question was, it can if how much more years of production can I do to my res residual tailings into the into this containment facility, uh, basically to get the license for the next uh, phase of the uh, mine site 
uh, from the CNSC. How much, how many more years of production can I do to put the tailings in there so that the pond surface is, uh, is at 505 meters above sea level? So that was the question that was asked. And uh, obviously, they do a lot of their own site investigation and bathymetric studies and uh, topographic studies at the base of the containment facility and whatnot. Uh, so we got involved in this uh, and, and our students did a wonderful job. The question that we were asked is twofold. Is the storage capacity adequate? And which is how many more years uh, can I put uh, tailings there and is this tailings going to be settling at a rate slow enough that that tailings do not release the contaminants of concern to the environment which is primarily uh, the radioactive uh, material well for this purpose we developed what we call a large strain consolidometer uh, in our radioactive tailings lab. The setup used uh, a transparent mold and a top uh, porous plate wrapped in a geotextile. The slurry was poured into the cell and the sample was allowed to settle under self-weight uh, by increment and then loaded by incrementally uh, loading it using physical <coughs> uh, applied stresses. Uh, an LVDT, which is you are seeing that at the top, which is a linear or variable displacement uh, transducer, uh, is is uh, measuring the deformation when we apply load or the volume reduction. Uh, when when it when it kind of ceases and the volume reduction ceases under a particular load then the water is allowed to flow in the upward direction, similar to that in a tailings facility, and that allows us to determine the hydraulic conductivity of the material. So I will apply one load and uh, determine the height of the sample with respect to time, and once that is done, I will do the hydraulic conductivity measurement again with respect to time, and then after that is done, I will apply a second load. And then I will determine a second hydraulic conductivity here and so on. OK, so I'm now going to take these points, the final points from these two charts, and I will do a number of these loads and a number of these conductivities and plot them uh, to determine what we call the constitutive relationships for numerical modeling. And those are effective stress versus change in volume or void ratio and hydraulic conductivity versus uh, void ratio. And my master students, Imtiaz Buyan, who is now uh, at Water Security Agency, managing about uh, 70 <laughs> large and small dams in this province, conducted the tests and he plotted the data in the form of these uh, constitutive relationships for compressibility, the top one, and conductivity is the lower one. And he did that for 4%, 5%, and 6% ores. Percent is the percentage of uranium in these ores. And, and then he used the historical sample, which is the blue sample, uh, in his modeling. To do his modeling, he kind of took cross-section of the uh, of the Dialman tailings uh, management facility and uh, at two levels. The AA cross-section is along the length and the BB is along the uh, perpendicular to that actually. Um, and then these cross-sections were based uh, on uh, the consolidation behavior of the deposited tailings and then he double-checked uh, the uh, uh, the settlement of the material through different topographical surveys, for example, in um, 1999, and then so many uh, field investigations in uh, 2004 and 5, uh, and 2001, separate, and, and 2008 also, in uh, cell B, 
and cell C and cell D. And these are uh, the vertical blue lines uh, with respect to cross section AA and the lower one is with respect to cross section BB. Uh, his research indicated that the uranium tailings, the water at a rate that does not allow the contaminants to go out with the water. The contaminants will be trapped within the soil while the clean water goes out. And that was uh, one uh, of the major um, interests, basically, or, or the objective of the research. The second one is he is showing that you can continue to um, to discharge tailings. This is uh, the gray area is the historical uh, tailings with sub aerial discharge. And then uh, uh, he is showing some more tailings from uh, a deposition from 2000 all the way to maybe 2008. And he said, if we are continuing at this rate, we will continue to be able to reach 505, uh, 505 meters above sea level uh, for another 30 years. So this rate is good. You can continue to deposit and continue to have your pond on top of the tailings till 2030, I guess. So this work was very important uh, for the uh, car for the industry in getting the license from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Agency to continue to do their production. Uh, here is the work of uh, uh, Maki Ito, uh, my postdoctoral student, who is also working with uh, the Water Security Agency again, uh, managing number of dams within the province. And this work is conducted at the Canadian light source. Uh, because the material is toxic, that is the tailings that I was dealing with, we were asked to further confirm if the rate is really slow enough uh, and the movement of water is through the soil is slow enough to really make sure that there is no contamination going out of it. For this purpose, uh, Ito did these subsamples. So, uh, very small little samples, 20 meter, 20 millimeter high and five millimeter circular samples. And she examined them at various uh, uh, maybe depths along the settling column here. And, uh, and then she uh, basically stacked all those images uh, through the X-ray synchrotron and stacked them on top of one another to create the three dimensional image from two dimensional images. In this one, she's now uh, basically uh, developing a micrometer level resolution. It's very high precision um, analysis here. And uh, once she was done with this, the porous structure uh, that she got in 3D, uh, that was used to determine the hydraulic conductivity of the settling slurry. She correlated the results of her model with empirical uh, uh, and measured data, and primarily with the cosine harman equation and the Peney and Skiffman formulation. And she showed uh, that theoretically, those equations and her image analysis are about the same. There is no real difference. Uh, and then she concluded that the dewatering rate is within the range to inhibit contaminant release. I would like to conclude this talk by saying uh, that we have the capacity here at the UFR uh, to address critical issues related to the management of water in terms of quantity and quality uh, for agriculture purposes and for mining purposes. Uh, we are producing here very highly qualified professionals uh, who are getting employment locally through high impact research uh, that is peer reviewed and industrially relevant. And our research supports economic growth uh, and environmental compliance at the same time and is also useful in developing adaptation strategies for climate change and, and, and so on. I'd like to really thank uh, our funding agencies, the NSERC, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Canada Foundation for uh, Innovation, Cameco, 
Clifton Associates, University of Regina, and so on. And uh, our students and scholars, postdoctoral fellows, PhD students, master's students, research engineers, for all of the hard work that they've completed. And uh, I really thank the National Center of Excellence in Geology for inviting me to do this presentation and all the audience for uh, being patient with me. Uh, I know it's been a diff different area, but uh, that's the beauty of knowledge, right? We learn from one another and uh, it never ceases. So thank you very much. And uh, maybe I'll uh, close here and go to our teams if there is any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shahid Azam Saab. It was a marvelous presentation. Uh, uh, during the talk, um, people had been contacting me for a for a copy of your presentation. Uh, I'm sure if there's a, not a pub, unpublished data, and you find it easy to share, otherwise that's not uh, necessary. So, uh, um, I would like now uh, to open the uh, to invite the audience to uh, put on their questions or comments or whatever they want to do. Uh, we would like to pick the audience uh, uh, the way we see it, but I apologize if there is any, uh, you know, if I pick someone who comes later than someone who is earlier. Uh, you can just raise your hands and I will uh, hand over to Banazir or a student uh, of PhD to entertain and coordinate the question and answer session. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Mohammed uh, Shahid Azam Saab. Uh, it was quite informative talk. Um, we have a question from Haris Fahim. Um, Haris Fahim, please introduce yourself and then you can ask a question. Please un unmute your mic. Okay. OK, you can go on to uh, Professor yeah. Matthias, please. Yeah. OK, yes. It was a very, very interesting yes. presentation. I learned a lot. I didn't know about these things, also about these experiments. Now, coming back to our research area, uh, I have just two questions to start with. First of all, you uh, introdu uh, introduced um, the experiments on flat areas where you have soil and evaporation from these soils. What would be the difference if you start uh, to investigate on slopes? Uh, not strong slopes, but maybe even uh, slopes in mountainous areas where you have movement, I think, uh, downward but it has an impact on the evaporation. And the second question would be, you discussed about uh, you know, uh, evaporation from lakes, from open waters. And I was surprised how much water is evaporating. You know, the, the, the amount is extreme. Now, you know that in uh, Pakistan, in the Indus area, and also in India and other places, you have these huge dams or uh, projects for huge dams, which are lakes in very hot areas. So there, if I'm if I'm correct, there must be an enormous uh, loss of water through evaporation from these lakes. Would it be better to make small lakes or store it in another way? Maybe you can give answers to these two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the slope part. Uh, we haven't investigated, uh, but I am assuming there will be runoff uh, and uh, there may be opportunity for, uh, for the water to go up also. Um, uh, runoff will be primarily uh, at the surface of the slope and then there will be a, a decent amount or some amount of water will be going into the soil in terms of infiltration. In terms of evaporation, the, the phenomena will remain the same, uh, at least conceptually, theoretically. Uh, but uh, of course, there will be 
those additional factors uh, of, of the slope, right? The slopey area in in here in in uh, in Canada is primarily not semi-arid, right? It's it's very uh, humid, such as in the west coast. It's a, a lot of rain, and so evaporation is not a problem there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, I, I wish some re researchers uh, uh, will work on that. But I did go to the Netherlands, and it's very very interesting. The entire country is kind of uh, within a perimeter dam, basically saving the country from the ocean. And it rains quite often. Now, the problem with those small dikes along the uh, along the uh, ocean or, or the river, they have to be remaining wet most of the time. And if they don't, that is, if they get a spell of no rain, drop, excuse me, drought kind of condition or a little drier, the dams crack. And that's a huge problem for for their safety of people and, and uh, basically the existence problem. So, <laughs> so uh, those are small slopes, very gentle slopes, not very high dikes, but small little evaporation and it's a huge problem for them. The second part of your uh, question is related to uh, reducing the surface area of the uh, of the lake itself, and uh, of course that will help uh, decrease the amount of evaporation. Mind you, on top of uh, the uh, the surface, or, or in addition to the surface area, you have a lot of long uh, time, if you will, when the lake surface is seeing the sun basically and therefore a, a lot more uh, solar radi irradiance and a lot more of uh, evaporation. So the answer to how can we solve that problem uh, is to cover it. <laughs> how do you do such large areas to cover from the sun? There is actually very interesting videos that I can actually <clears throat> point you to at smaller scales though, where they're using black balls of plastic, basically releasing about oh, millions of them to cover the so to cover the lake surface. And they're doing it in California. So uh, that's one way to cover your uh, your thing. And you can actually continue to do all the uh, the things within that lake, even if it is covered with those small little balls. You can do like yachting in there. The birds will still come, and it's all uh, <laughs> the only thing is it's covered. So I I don't know if I answered your question fully, but uh, here are some of my random <clears throat> thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you. But uh, I could not imagine that, for instance, for Pasha Dam, you cover it with black plastic. That's not really possible. Or Tarbela no. or so. No. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a good hint. Yeah. Thank you. Well, elsewhere okay. uh, in, in Baluchistan, I know that there is a system of uh, uh, covering the uh, canals, and it's called a uh, carres. And Professor John would maybe know more about that uh, kind of historical, traditional way of uh, irrigation underground. Response, just okay. a quick response to that. Un unfortunately, the Kare system is literally collapsing. There mm. is so much extraction of water from the ground uh, because of tube wells that the Kare is in danger. But in older time, it was underground system of irrigation with little evaporation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question from Khoram Khan. Um, Khoram, please, you can unmute your mic and ask a question. Uh, thank you very much. Khoram. Uh, Dr. Saab, uh, <clears throat> I have, uh, I'm from Army Corps of Engineers and uh, I have little experience of research in, uh, during my grad studies in Wisconsin, Madison, we had a lake and I was working on restoration of a small wetland 
which was interacting with the uh, flow field changes during uh, in spatial and temporal uh, domain. So, sir, uh, uh, in the hydrological uh, framework, uh, this may be a comment, may not be a question. Uh, what I could gather that we are a little bit worried about uh, extra evaporation from uh, bigger water bodies like lakes and uh, uh, big rivers like which, which exist in Pakistan. But in the hydrological domain, once we see the total hydrologic ecosystem, the evaporation plays a very important part in sustainable uh, environment. So what would you say about that? So the meaning of a sustainable, and you mean everything, including the canal system and your dam and so on, and also evaporation from sorry from the field, like the evapotranspiration and so Hello. on. In, in I think there is some. There, can 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 everyone else uh, turn off their microphones because there seems to be a sort of echo in the system. G Chadazam sir, please. Yeah, so I, I think by sustainable, uh, I think the meaning would have been something like. Uh, evaporation not only from the lake surface, but also from soil surfaces, also from the canal system, also from evapotranspiration and all of that. And yes, I agree, evaporation is just one part of the entire puzzle. And I only showed you very limited information, the type of work that our students been involved. Of course, uh, large scale, projects uh, need to be exercised uh, and conducted in the field. Of course, uh, more analysis and different types of analysis, spatial, temporal, remote sensing, uh, uh, SWOT modeling or any other type of regional scale modeling, all of those will be useful only from a technical perspective though. And then there is the policy perspective. And then uh, I think Dr. Abu Bakr talked about that uh, in his in his talk last week and so on. So yeah, I, I, it's a holistic approach that we have to take. And uh, once again, knowledge is uh, one and we are only looking at from different aspects. So all of this is uh, yeah. together, right? So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, we have another question from Dr. Sayed Mubashir Raftal. Um, sir, please ask a question. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Dr. Mubashir. I'm a professional hydrogeologist. Uh, Dr. Sir, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Among other studies, you mentioned oil sand tailing. As a hydrogeologist, I got a chance to work for Alberta oil sand for the depressurizing of mined groundwater and later on reinjection the same water into the same geological formations. That's a highly saline water. As per Canadian EPA policy, there are two ways to dispose the mined water, by treatment to the level of nearby creeks or streams and dispose into the streams. If not possible, re-inject mined water to the same geological formations. The re-injection of brines is a very tricky and expensive method. Do you think, sir, is it possible to treat the mined water in some economical way? Yeah, treatment, water treatment is not really my area. Here again in Saskatchewan, what they do is for potash mining, which is basically going deeper about the kilometer, more than that, into the ground, getting the potash, KCL, potassium chloride, that is, and then making huge tunneling system and then because you cannot dig uh, if you don't have a plan uh, to reclaim the area but they basically show in their uh, environmental impact assessment is I'll I'll take this tailings water which is high which is brine and put it back into the into the uh, open area in underground and therefore there is no environmental problem so they don't treat it it's very difficult 
to bring to to separate, if you will, the brine from the water. And uh, the only way that I can probably mention is through evaporation. The problem with uh, the brine is it creates a small little crust on the surface of the, the pond and therefore kind of isolates the pond from the from the sun. And therefore, uh, the crust may be uh, salty, but everything below that is not really. Uh, the other problem with that is the when it is brackish water or a lot of brine in uh, or a lot of uh, sodium chloride, etc., in the water, uh, it doesn't freeze, which may be a good thing. But the problem is it also doesn't evaporate that much. And uh, and therefore, it's very difficult to separate the sodium chloride from, um, and it may be a shortcoming. Uh, but treatment-wise, uh, uh, I don't have much experience in water treatment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, I have a simple question. Um, as you mentioned earlier that uh, um, in winter we have zero uh, zero evapotranspiration. So is it possible, although we get uh, solar radiation throughout the day, so there might be some evapotranspiration uh, in the winter as well. So if, please can you... Yeah, I think that uh, I, I know in terms of uh, evaporation, uh, I think it's called something else as opposed to evaporation in the winter time. I do see vapor and I do see in the winter time and I'm talking minus 30 here and I do see crystal uh, like ice crystals basically the relative the, the humidity in the air is converted to crystal ice crystal that is and uh, is and, and that is a change in form. You see, water is changing to ice, and that is called oh. condensation as opposed to evaporation. So it's a little bit different. Now, what happens to it afterwards, uh, when the top will also come down, so it's not going to the air and becoming cloud later on. It's still there, right? So when the temperature comes back, uh, but but I, I, again, you need to maybe explore a little bit more for all practical purposes, though. The lake surface is fully covered with snow in the winter time and a very thick layer of snow. And so therefore, we assume the water is under there and it's not really evaporating. That was our assumption. OK, OK, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so now before uh, we end this talk, I would like to introduce um, a next week webinar. Um, yeah, and it's a very, very important topic. Yeah. OK, uh, it, will, it will be about a surface and groundwater scenario of Balochistan present, past, and future by Dr. Sayed Mubashir Aftab, uh, Associate Professor, Butim Skirta, Pakistan. So uh, we will share a new link for uh, this that webinar, and we are looking forward to welcome you all next week and same day. I will now request all of you guys to turn on your cameras so that we have a group photo. And uh, Banazir, you have to add, uh, in case someone wants to retrieve these recordings, we have uh, created a website, yeah. um, a YouTube channel for that, and uh, people can retrieve that over and again, uh, particularly those who have not been able to go uh, or attend the talk completely.